Thanks so much for joining us today. We'd love to know how God is using this ministry to touch your life. So please take a moment and send us your story by going to ChristianLifeRantool.com and clicking on Amen Central. Thanks again for joining us, and we hope you enjoy today's message. If you are visiting with us, you picked a good week because we are starting a brand new series, and we're calling it Relationships Matter. And when you think about it, there's really nothing that matters in life more than the quality of your relationships. I mean, you can make millions of dollars, you can climb the corporate ladder, you can have the respect of your peers, but it's all going to be empty and meaningless if you don't have meaningful relationships in your life. I heard someone once say it like this, you'll never be happier than the quality of your relationships. And I'm just telling you, church, that's true. Beyond our relationship with God, the most important relationship anybody can have is that of a man and a woman in the context of marriage. And that's what we're going to talk about today. In fact, this relationship is supposed to model Christ's love for his church, and it's supposed to be appealing to those outside the church. We're going to talk about why the Bible explains, and I don't think I need to really spend a lot of time on this, but how many of you know marriage really isn't working today? I mean, you know the statistics. I don't need to go over them, but marriage is broken in a lot of ways, and the Bible's going to tell us why that is, but more importantly, what we can do to establish strong relationships. Jimmy Evans has been quoted as saying this, your marriage has a 100% chance of success if you'll do it God's way. And you know what? That's not just a fancy quote to me because my wife and I have actually lived that out. When we came to faith in Christ, we were a year and a half into marriage and we were on the fast track for divorce. In fact, my wife was already planning how she was going to leave me and I was just going to be one of those guys who never saw it coming and said, I don't know what her problem was, but I should have saw it coming. And the reality is God put us back together and you know what the word says? He's no respecter of persons. What he can do for one, he will do for another. And some of you, you may be coming in here struggling this morning, but I wanted you to leave with hope. Our prayer is that God gives you one thing to work on. And you know what? Cheryl and I, this year, will hit, in September, our 20th wedding anniversary. And um, you know what? There's a lot of you that are... um, Thank you for that. Uh, There's some of you in this room that are 50 years plus. And the reality is, we've got a whole lot more we can learn from you than you can learn from us. Uh, The real reality of it is you're probably going to learn a lot more from our mistakes than you will from what we get right. But that's the deal we've made with God. If he can use anything in our mistakes to better your life, then so be it. It is is free for him to use. But our prayer is this one thing. You will leave with one thing that will dramatically improve your marriage over time. Let's pray. Father, we just uh, thank you for your Holy Spirit. We feel his presence today powerful in the first service. God, we believe it's going to be the same in this one. And I just pray, God, that you would speak to hearts. Anybody discouraged, anybody who feels like their relationship is irreconcilable, God, Father, your, your word clearly shows that that's not true. There is always hope, but God, we got to do it your way. So as we study what your way of marriage is and how it's supposed to work, God, give us the grace and help us to find the one thing that, God, we can implement to make a dramatic difference in our lives. And God, do it for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to Genesis chapter 2. And uh, I think I started in verse 18 in your sermon notes, but we're actually going to, for time's sake, go to verse 21. And this is really how God defines marriage right here in the beginning of the Bible, Genesis 2. And it said, And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs, and he closed up the flesh in its place. And then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman, and he brought her to Adam. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. We see three things as the Lord defines marriage. And and the first is that this is an exclusive arrangement. In other words, marriage is to be between one man and one woman. And the Supreme Court can rule however they want to, and they can even, as they did, successfully change man's laws, but that doesn't change God's definition of marriage. One man, one woman, period. The other thing that we see is it's sacred. And you know what the problem is in our society today? Nothing sacred. 
Nothing sacred. And you want to know why? And you want to know what the result of that, I guess, would be better said? It, it's marriage isn't working. That's why it's working. See, see, when it's not a covenant, and that's what we're talking about. By the way, the word covenant just simply means to cut. And in Old Testament times, they would cut up uh, different kinds of animals. And the idea was, so shall it be done to us if we break this arrangement. But it was a covenant. And this is what God did with Adam. He cut into Adam. Now, the word doesn't say that, but it does say he put his flesh back. In other words, God just didn't supernaturally transpose his rib. He actually cut Adam. There was shedding of blood. Without the shedding of blood, there is no covenant. So this was established as a covenant. Let me tell you the difference between a contract and a covenant. A contract, what we do is we protect our rights and we limit our responsibilities. That's why you would go to an attorney to set up a contract. That's that's why, really honestly, prenuptial agreements are really doomed from the get-go because there was a lack of trust right off the bit go. They were just trying to protect themselves. And then a covenant, we, we contrast that, we give up our rights and we pick up our responsibilities. Do you see the difference? It's a huge difference, and it's why Christian marriages aren't working. When we hear the statistics that divorce in the church is the same in the world, you want to know why? Because we're treating it as a contract the same way that they are. But here's, here's something else to think about, too. Do you ever realize that there are Christian couples out there, or non-Christian couples, I should say, that have great marriages? You probably know somebody. They're not Christian. But you know why it works for them? Because they're treating it as a covenant. Biblical principles work whether you're a Christian or not. And some people follow biblical principles and make it work. And sadly, too many in the church don't, and it's not working. Are you following me so far? The, the last thing is it's in a permanent union. In other words, God says this is an everlasting covenant. There was no intention that this would ever be a temporary thing. And, and you know what? You find couples that sometimes, uh, and you probably have known somebody like this, or maybe you were involved in a relationship like this, but they can't wait for a divorce, right? Because the marriage is bad and unhealthy, and they just really don't love the person anymore. But then what happens is they get out of the marriage, and then they go through all this unimaginable pain, and they can't figure out why. And the reason is, is because they broke covenant, okay? And God has a way that he can heal that, but, but that's the reason for the pain, is because they actually broke covenant before God. I want to talk to you today about some indicators of a lasting marriage, if you're taking notes. And, and really, what, what I mean by this, these are signs that, that you're actually in a covenant relationship. It's not just a contract to you if you're following these steps, and, and again, I'm just going to share with you some things that Cheryl and I have learned through the years. Some of this has been uh, through personal counseling that I've gone to. Some of it we've just figured out on our own. Some of it's been through teaching, and, uh, and I hope you learn from it. The first is a strong spiritual foundation. There's this story in the Bible that we refer to as the woman at the well. And Jesus comes up to her. She's a Samaritan woman, and he says to her, Woman, will you pour me a glass of water, a cup of water? And she says, how can you, being a Jew, say to me, a Samaritan, give you water? Okay, now what you need to know is that in the Jewish law, the the Samaritans and the Jews were not supposed to be interacting. And Jesus says to her, he says, if you knew who was asking you for the water, you would ask me for living water, and you would never thirst again. Well, the lady thinks that's a pretty good deal. She says, sir, give me some of that water. He says, well, I'll tell you what, bring your husband. And she says, well, I don't have a husband. He says, you're right in saying you don't have a husband. You've had five, and the guy you're with now, he's not your husband either. And when you hear that, there's kind of, at least in me, there's a little bit of a pushback because it sounds like Jesus is being so harsh, doesn't it? But, but you know what he's saying? He's saying, you have deep needs that only I can meet. And you can go through a hundred husbands, but they're never going to be able to fill fulfill that part of you that I made for only me to reach. Are you tracking with me? And you know what? I want you to tell you, the church, it's the same thing for us. (laughs) If you are looking for your spouse to be Jesus for you, you're in for a disappointment. We can make pretty good husbands and pretty good wives with, with the help of God, but we make terrible saviors. And, and I'm just telling you, some people come into relationships, you know, we all come with some kind of deficit, right? We all come with some kind of deficit, and we're expecting our spouse to make up for that part of us that's lacking. And I'm just telling church, it doesn't work. 
Only God can do that. So we need a strong spiritual foundation, and that starts by establishing that upon the rock of Christ Jesus. Remember, your marriage has a 100% chance of success if you'll do it God's way. And you know what that means? That means you got to let God call the shots. Years ago, I had a plan. It's been said, if you ever want to make God laugh, make plans. So I had this plan. And my plan was I was going to be done having kids by age 30. And if my plan would have worked, I'm 46 now. In a couple of years, I'd be an empty nester. And I was looking forward to my freedom, and it just sounded like a good plan. And uh, anyways, we had our third son. And it sounds like I orchestrated this right down to the day almost because my first son and my third child was born two days before my 30th birthday. It's like, thank you, Jesus. That's a sign from the Lord. This is to stop, and we're done right here. Problem was, Cheryl and I both, after he was born, got this unsettled feeling that God wasn't done, that our, that our family wasn't complete yet. So Cheryl says, uh, I feel this way, and I had to admit I feel this way too. And I said, no matter what, I'll tell you what, no matter what, after that fourth child, we're done. Nobody has five kids today, so after this fourth kid, we're done. Well, again, if you want to make God laugh. And so anyway, so we did have a fifth for the exact same reason. We felt like God wasn't complete, and then we felt like our family was complete, and we had perfect peace and stopping it from there. But, but the world thinks that, that you're crazy if you have five kids. In fact, let's show the slides. This is what people think in relation to how many kids you have. Zero kids, when are you going to have a baby? One kid, when are you going to have another one? One boy, one girl, perfect, you're done. Two boys, you need to try for a girl. Two girls, you need to try for a boy. Three kids, that was an accident, right? Fourth kid, use some freaking birth control. And five-plus kids, you obviously want your own reality show freaks. All right, now, the truth was, we didn't want our own reality show. We just wanted to obey God. And, and I'm telling you, church, you got to let God, if we want the spiritual foundation to be strong, he has to be able to decide how that looks and what that means. You know, one of the obvious ways that we put God first in the marriage is that we pray regularly as a couple together. And Jimmy Evans said this, prayer couples that pray together regularly have a 2% divorce rate. Now, he didn't cite where he got that um, statistic, but I believe it because really, at the end of the day, it just makes sense, doesn't it? If a couple consistently brings their relationship together before the Lord and says, God, make this work, do you think God's going to honor that? The reality is, anything built on the foundation of Jesus Christ stands. And anything that is not built upon him is at risk. The second indicator of a lasting marriage, or the second indicator that you understand covenant, is the relationship is prioritized. You know, Cheryl and I, when we, we first came to faith, we realized our, our marriage was a disaster. So we said, okay, what we need is to think about somebody, a relative or, or one of our friends that had the kind of marriage we'd want. And Cheryl, so I asked her, I said, who, who would that be for you? And she thought about it for some time. She said, I've I never seen it before. What I want, I've never seen before. And I had to say, you know, the same is true for me. But this is what we knew, that if it wasn't built on the foundation of Jesus Christ, and if we weren't prioritizing each other, it wasn't going to work. So we just started figuring out this stuff ourselves. And, and you know, one of the biggest mistakes I think that parents make is they prioritize their children above their spouse. And it almost sounds godly the way that they do it, you know. They say that the needs of the kids are just such that we just don't have time for each other. But, but here's the thing, and here's where the, the argument breaks down and really doesn't make a lot of sense. is because if mom and dad doesn't make it, don't make it, guess what? Junior's going to be left without one of his parents in the home. And how can that possibly be the best thing for the child? That's why the Bible says you will leave your mother and father and cleave to your wife. It didn't say you cleave to your children. And yet all too often, that's, that's what we see. So Cheryl and I, part of our prioritizing of our relationship was to do a date night. So we started this, I don't know, maybe five years ago. Every Thursday night, just about no matter what, we, we try to hit our date night. 
And I like to talk about it a lot in church because probably a dozen guys throughout the years have come and said, hey, I implemented that and it's been really good for my marriage. By the way, ladies, you're welcome if that happens to be one of you today. But it would be my desire really that everyone would do that. They would take a night a week and just spend some time with their spouse. It's so valuable. But last year, the Blackhawks happened to play a Stanley Cup home game on Thursday night. So I thought, what's more romantic than grown men smashing their faces up against the glass? Maybe it's just me. So I went and got tickets, and then my boys heard that I got tickets for the game, and they just said, Dad, that ain't right. They said, there ought to be three tickets, and we ought to be going, not Mom. And I said, what are you talking about? They said, Mom doesn't even know what a blue line is. I said, she knows what a blue line is. Honey, tell them what a blue line is. She does this. I said, that's besides the point. And they said, but Dad, it proves that she's not into hockey. I said, yeah, but she's into me. And we're going to a hockey game, and we're going to enjoy ourselves. I went all out. I, even, I think we have a picture. I even got her a sweatshirt with the Blackhawks here. She's already mad at me for not warning her the first one, so I figured I might as well just go all the way and show it to you again. But that picture is taken at Lou Malnati's Pizzeria, some of the best thick stuffed pizza in Chicago. Nobody's getting excited. I thought you would. But it's just what happened was the, the, the Hawks won the cup, but they lost that game. So we went there just kind of to sulk and let that cheese kind of fill the cracks of the soul. <laughs> Nobody understands what I'm talking about. But I don't know. It worked for me. But in any event, you know, that's how we have prioritized our relationship. We do fun things together, which means I have to do things she's interested in. Because at the end of the day, she doesn't know what a blue line is. You still don't know what a blue line is. No. Anyways, so we went to art class, Right? And, and we're drawing a tree. And so she draws like the, the framework of the tree. And then I got to like add branches, right? So we got this beautiful start of a tree and half branches look good. And then it's just, we can't even hang it. It just looks like a little kid did the design. But you know what? We had a good time. And that's the point. You need to do things that, that you're having fun together. Marriage conferences, Turns out I like marriage conferences. Now, there was a day and age where I would have told you, you know, three places I don't want to be, sitting in a tax audit, sitting in a dentist chair, or sitting in a marriage conference, okay? But you know what? I, I got, I'll tell you a secret. This is what I discovered about the marriage conference. And I'll tell you guys if it doesn't leave this room. Deal? Women feel romantic at marriage conferences. They do. I love marriage conference. I'm like a marriage conference groupie. I, I, I can't get enough of them, all right? But, but you know what? Great marriages, guys, seriously, just don't happen. They're the result of couples being very intentional in prioritizing the relationship. And can I tell you the real truth? There's a lot of guys who are more loyal to the team than they are to their wife. And if we're going to turn this thing around, that, that's got to change. One, pre one preacher said it like this, if the grass looks greener on the other side, water your lawn. Point two, indicator of a lasting, point three, indicator of a lasting marriage is affection. Now there's some people who think that you shouldn't show affection in front of your kids. And I'll just tell you, I, I adamantly disagree with that. We, we gross our kids out. Okay, now I, I mean in an appropriate way, right? But I mean, we kiss and hug in front of our kids. We don't think anything of it. A couple weeks ago, maybe a month ago, we, we got back from date night. It's Thursday. Kids were in the basement. They didn't know we're home. So we're in the kitchen and we're just kissing. And one of, the, one of the kids walks in, my son, and he says, Oh, come on, guys, get a room. I said, You know what? That's a great idea. We need to put your little butt to bed first, though, right? <laughs> he hadn't told us to get a room since then. All right, but, but you know what? In all seriousness, you know what that does for your relationship with your kids? Because I guarantee you, your, your son or your daughter knows somebody at school, they got a teammate, a classmate, somebody, maybe even at church, who's going through a divorce or has been through a divorce, and you know what that does? It puts a little insecurity in their little hearts, right? But when they see that mom and dad are affectionate and they love each other, you know what, they, they know it's going to be okay. And it's so important that we show affection in, in front of our kids. And you know what? It's just important for us and for our relationship, you know? Uh, one thing that Cheryl kind of called me on was on, on our honeymoon, we held hands in public everywhere we went. 
you know? And then after that, it's like, you know, we'd be in the mall, and I'm like, all right, we're in a mall. Do we really need to hold hands? And, and she called me out. She says, you know, on our honeymoon, you had no problem holding hands. And so I just, you know, started, and I drew the line because she'd like to swing, and no, the arm is stationary, okay? <laughs> See a group of guys, I'm not going to come by swinging. It's, it's up. You know, I wanted to... But, you know, we, we, we need to be showing that affection. We need to be showing that affection. And, and, and let me just say this as we finish up with affection. That affection needs to be exclusively for your spouse. And, and you're saying, you know, really that shouldn't even need to be talked about, right? But I'll tell you, in the marketplace, I've just seen things over the years that are so alarming to me. And one was, I was about 25 years old and I worked in Chicago and uh, we worked with a lot of nurses. And there was another guy, he was about my age, and I don't know how to explain this guy. I'm not trying to be mean, but I just say he's kind of a creepy guy. You know, he wasn't a good-looking guy. Um, he's just kind of weaselly. And uh, anyways, we had this nurse, and really pretty lady. She was probably about 40 at the time, considerably older than us. And she was a Christian woman, shared her testimony with me, actually really started drawing me back to God. And anyways... She was stressed out at the nurse's station one day and, you know, just stretching her neck. And he came up behind her and just started giving her a massage. And she's like, oh, that feels so good. And he's rubbing her. And, you know, again, I'm not a Christian. I'm not walking with God. But afterwards, I, I pulled him in the back room. I said, dude, that's completely inappropriate. She's a married woman. And he's like, and it's just, I'm just helping her to relax, you know, lighten up. Okay, within two weeks, they were having an affair. You know, and I've seen things like that. I'm telling you, it, it's, he, he's the kind of guy that the Bible says draws away gullible women from their homes. Okay, but can I tell you there's gullible men too? And this is what we fall for. We fall for that woman in the gym or in the workplace who, who's just flattering us, right? And, and it's subtle at first, it, but, but the problem is it, apply, it, it attracts our ego. We want to hear stuff like that, and especially if you're not hearing it from home. And, and guess what? You just start, well, I can play around with that, but, but can I tell you, you can't, you know? And th this woman, you'll know her because she laughs at your messed up jokes like they're really funny, right? But you know what the Bible says? The Bible says, can a man pour hot coals into his lap and not be burned? And that's exactly what you're heading for. And I'm bringing that up because some of you this morning, that's your one thing. You need to knock that off. There's someone out there making inappropriate advances to you or you're making inappropriate advances to them. And can I tell you, church, it's a dangerous, dangerous thing. This is what Proverbs 5 says, and this verse is talking about sexual intimacy, which you'll see in a minute. It says, drink water from your own cistern, running water from your own well. Should your springs overflow in the street and your streams of water in the public squares? Let them be yours alone, never to be shared with strangers. May your fountain be blessed, and may you rejoice in the wife of your youth. A loving doe, a graceful deer, may her breast satisfy you always. There's guys that have that on their refrigerator. That's funny. I don't care what you say. That's funny. <laughs> may you ever be intoxicated with her love. My son, why be intoxicated with another man's wife? Why embrace the bosom of a married woman? Wayward woman. And, and, and church, I'll just tell you honestly, the only woman that can intoxicate me is the woman who gave birth to my children because she's the only one who's earned the right. By the way, it was okay to laugh at that joke. It's in the Bible. But. <laughs> All right, mutual, mutual honor, number four. This is what Peter said. Husbands, likewise, dwell with them, referring to your wives, with understanding, giving honor to the wife, as to the weaker vessel, let's stop right there. The weaker vessel, it, he's simply talking about physical strength. In other words, might doesn't make right. Yeah, you can you dominate your wife, but it's ungodly. That's what he's saying. And as being heirs together of the grace of life. And what he's talking about is heirs together. She is just as much of a child of God as you are. Now, this is interesting that your prayers may not be hindered. Can I tell you, there, there's some guys in this room and I'm just telling you from personal experience, okay, you used to have a close, intimate relationship with God, and you're striving for that, and you're trying to get back to that place, and it's like there's a lid on heaven. It's like heaven's closed for business. And this is what people told me when that started to happen. They said, you know what, Barry, when you first come to faith, God just moves in your life in such profound ways, and then as time goes on, he, he just really doesn't move and speak like that. And you know what, that's not true. 
What the truth of the matter was is I wasn't honoring my wife in several different ways. I was harsh with her. My tone was rough. And you know what? God was saying, you're not going to honor her. We're not talking. It's got predictable. Cheryl and I, I'd get ready to go and... Uh, Go to bed and let's just assume that I'm upset about something. And then I'm not even going to talk to her and I'm pouting because this is what I did back then. And I just, you know, that woman you gave me, I'd say to God, you know. But what would happen is I'd get in bed and I'd try to pray. There's nothing happening. So I'd pop out and, 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 and she got used to this to the point she said, oh, you're coming to make up with me. God's not hearing your prayer. And it used to tick me off, you know. I even tried like a half-hearted, yeah, I'm sorry, I went back into bed, still nothing. Come back out, she goes, God wants you to do it right. Yes, God wants me to do it right. You know, but I'm telling you, I'm telling you, some of you, your, your prayers are being hindered because of this, and you, got, you need to make it right, you need to make it right. You know, we honor our spouses by remaining sexually pure, and I'm talking a lot to the men um, in this section, particularly because men are visual Creatures. and In other words, our eye gate is something we got to be very, very careful with. Job said this, I've made a covenant with my eyes not to even look upon a young woman because he knew the danger in doing so. And some of us would do well to take Job's advice and take it that seriously. I've heard it taught like this, you know, the first look you don't control, but the second one you do. The second one I have to say, okay, I'm not taking a second glance. And just for clarification, guys, that doesn't mean you get one long, continual stare. We honor or we dishonor our spouses by the way we communicate. You know, sometimes it's just the tone. Sometimes it's just a, a harsh tone towards our spouse. I, I can remember um, working in, in, in business, and I'd go through my day, and, and I'd come home, and I'd just be tired and irritable. How many of you guys can relate? You're not the one's going to admit it. How many women can say you can relate to their husbands? Okay. Anyways, I, I'd come home, and, I did, and, and Cheryl would just get so frustrated with me, you know? And I, and I would make this comment. I'd say, you know what? All day long, i got to walk on eggshells, okay? I'm going to come home and just be myself. So one day, she got tired of the eggshell speech, and I went, started to go into it. And she says, you know what? Barry, maybe that ought to tell you something. If you've got to fake it all day and then come home and be yourself, you know what she's saying? You know, you're pretending not to be a jerk when you're really a jerk, and then you come home and just be a jerk. Come on, somebody. And, and the realization is I needed God to change my heart. You know, I needed my tone to change towards my wife. Don't they deserve at least as much respect as some stranger you're meeting in the workplace? As much as your coworkers? You know, one of the ways that, that I honor Cheryl is uh, the kids see me open car doors for her. Um, they know mom's queen bee. You know, this is just the way that it is. And they also know that if, if they disrespect me in some way, there's going to be consequences. But if they disrespect my wife, they know that's a capital offense. And I'm telling you guys, it's important that you establish that in your home. Um, my, my kids know that's do not draw the lane. I don't call them, call her their mother. I call her my wife. You disrespected my wife. You know what mutual honor means? It means that there's no room for secrets in marriage. Some of you, this is your one thing. You got a secret. It may be a big thing. It may be a small thing, but you got to open up and you got to bring that out into the light if you want all God has for your marriage. And I'll tell you, ladies, I talked a lot about men in this section. Um, your, your husband's primary need is for respect and if he's not getting it from you, there's a lady out there somewhere who's going to tell him how awesome he is, even if he isn't. And I'm telling you, it's just a dangerous game to play. You need to be honoring our spouses. Believe the best. We'll hit this quickly. We're running out of time. Um, Andy Stanley says there's a, a gap between oftentimes what we expect from someone and then the actual result, okay? And, and, and he says what you put in that gap makes all the difference in the world. So in other words, let's say I come home with flowers for my wife just as a hypothetical situation. This is what I'm expecting to happen as a result of that. I'm expecting her to tell me how awesome I am and to give me a hug and just, you know, maybe that leads to something else later, right? But instead, what I get is the cold shoulder and it's just like, oh, that's nice. And, and she's, okay, now I got a choice, right? I, I can just say, there she goes again, unappreciative, 
right? And that's what a lot of us do. A lot of us would give a lot more respect to a stranger than we would to our spouse. We'd give them the benefit of the doubt, but we don't give our spouse the benefit of the doubt. But if instead I, I just say, you know, honey, what's going on? Are you having a bad day? Guess what? That turns into this beautiful relationship where I'm actually there to encourage her instead of starting World War III because I brought home flowers. And some of you know what I'm talking about. It's those stupid arguments, it's like, how did I bring home flowers and it turned into this big knockdown drag out? It, it did because you didn't put in the gap the benefit of the doubt for your spouse. I need to pick up the pace. Number six, indicator of a lasting marriage is that they resolve conflict quickly. If you've been married for more than a month, you know that, that you're going to have conflict in your marriage, Right? And if you're not there yet, just disregard everything I'm about to say because I would just assume you live in blissful ignorance as long as possible because eventually you're going to find this out, that there's just friction in a marriage, right? There's just conflict. But listen, the secret is dealing with it quickly. Let's look at Ephesians. Chapter 4, verse 26 and 27. There, there's a lot in this. Be angry and do not sin. In other words, you're going to get angry. But when you do, don't sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. Now, why would he say, don't let the sun go down on your wrath? Because here you are, you got anger, right? And, and you can deal with that anger and, and just get it over with and done, or you can sleep on it. And guess what happens when you sleep on it? It begins to grow. And, and some of us have slept on it not only for weeks, but for months and years and sometimes decades, and you got so much resentment, so much bitterness going on. Why? Because it's a seed, and you let it grow, and you let it get out of control. Some of you need to deal with that. But here's the other part of that verse, which I find very interesting. Nor give place to the devil. <laughs> you know, Satan's literal translation of his name is accuser of the brethren. And you know how you're giving place to the devil? You're allowing him to accuse your spouse, and you're coming into agreement with him. Right? Because what's that voice you begin to hear? Oh, she'll never change. This is, she always does this. Oh, he's so inconsiderate. He, he doesn't care about my feelings, right? And that's growing into something that honestly, if you just dealt with, could have been done very, very quickly. Grudges have no place in marriage. My daughter Leah, years ago, um, well, she had friends over all the time. All my kids have their friends over. We kind of like being the place where kids like to come. And uh, anyways, one of her friends once said to her, and she's telling this after she went home, she said, you know what she asked me? She says, do your parents ever fight? And what was even more strange was that was Leah's response. She says, you know what? I guess they really don't. And I'll, I'll just be real honest with you. I'm not necessarily a real emotional guy. It, it got me a, a emotional to the point of tears because I remembered when she was a baby, okay? And, and here... She's in my house, and she doesn't remember what it was like then, but, but she's never, maybe just a couple of times, heard her dad even raise his voice. And the answer is, of course we fight. But we do it behind closed doors, and really we never are raising our voice, and we finish this real quickly. But there was a day when she was little that the neighbors knew we fought. The cars driving through the neighborhood knew we fought. You know, there was no mistake about it. And I thought about that, and it just was like, God, you are so awesome. It just made me want to glorify and worship God who did this transforming work in our lives. And can I tell you, church, he's no respecter of persons. The Bible says what he'll do for one, he'll do for another. And some of you, that's your one thing. That's your one thing. You need to start dealing with this stuff. Last but certainly not least is about speaking life. Indicators of a lasting marriage is that they speak life. This is what Proverbs 18 says. It says, A man's stomach shall be satisfied from the fruit of his mouth. From the produce of his lips he shall be filled. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. Now listen to this. He who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. I find it interesting that those verses are put together. Now, in fairness, sometimes Proverbs just jump all over the place and they go from different themes all throughout. I think this was intentional, though. I think what God is saying is you have the power to bless or curse your marriage with the words that you choose. I was talking to a lady this week, and um, she called me for a different reason, but in the 
course of conversation, she says, you know, Bear, I just want to share something with you. She says, my husband's just been unbelievable lately. And I said, oh, yeah, how so? She says, he's just been sending me little text messages. I said, really? She says, yeah, he's just saying, you're so cute, and I, I just miss you. And, and I'm like, really, he normally doesn't do this? She says, no, never. But he's been doing this for several weeks. And she said, at first, it freaked me out. He came home, I said, who are you, and what'd you do with my husband, you know? And, and at first, some of you guys might start freaking your wives out. But, but over time, boy, it makes such a difference, you know? What, what I'll do is I go home for lunch, because obviously I work in town here, and um, I see my wife then, but I try to call her through the day, and if I don't have time, sometimes even I don't have time to text, I'll just send one of those little emojis, you know, a little guy with hearts in his eyes or something. And uh, you know what, just something little like that means so much to her. I kind of like the emojis coming back my way, too, by the way. I had to ask in the first service if that's even how you pronounce those things. Um, you know, before I got married, my, my dad gave me some advice. Now, what you understand is my dad wasn't a Christian, uh, but he accidentally gave me some pretty good advice, you know, biblical advice. And the one thing was, he says, Barry, you know, you, if you're going to go through this marriage, you know, don't cheat on her. If you're going to do that, just don't get married, you know. And, of course, I didn't believe in that, and that wasn't a big deal. But the better advice he gave me, he says, you know, there's going to be times when she's the person you dislike most on the face of this earth, and you're going to be tempted to use the divorce word. You're going to be tempted to threaten it. You're going to be tempted to throw it out there. And I just want to tell you that once it's been thrown out there, you can't take that back. And what he was talking about was a woman's primary need for security. And once that's breached, there, there's a problem. So, so several years after that, we come to Jesus, and I'm leading a, probably a decade or so ago, I'm leading a small group in our home, and I've got this lesson on marriage, and I think it's pretty good. I put a lot of effort into it. Actually, it's a lot of the stuff we're talking about today. And I'm getting ready to throw this on the group. And, and kind of last minute, I feel like God's saying, forget that message, and I want you to talk to them about the dangers of, of, of using the word divorce and threatening it. And, and I said to myself, I, you know, I wasn't trying to be disobedient. I really just thought, everybody knows this. You know, like everybody had the conversation with my dad or something. I just thought, Christians don't do this, you know. I said, God, this is, it can't be you. So I just went through with my lesson. I don't know if you've ever um, taught a lesson or you preached or anything like that, but there's times when, you know, your words just go out and they hit a wall. In other words, there's no anointing on it. And I'm looking at, man, people are glassy-eyed. People are looking out the window. And I'm like, this is good, too. I'm thinking, what's wrong with these people? And I thought, you know what? I'm just going to go with what I thought God told me. So I just stopped the lesson. I said, you know what? I prepared this lesson, but really what I thought God wanted to say today is that, man, don't ever threaten divorce in your marriage. And I'm thinking, boy, do I feel silly now. And I'm getting ready to go to another topic, you know, and hit back into my lesson. And a girl just starts crying. And she says, I, I, I told my husband that yesterday. And they stood up and kind of came together and they hugged and she asked for his forgiveness. And then um, it, it wasn't too much longer that another couple got up and they said, hey, you know, we talk like that all the time. We, we threaten divorce constantly. And then there was a third guy who stood up and he says, you know, I haven't done it in a long time, but, but I've done that too. And we had this beautiful moment to where they really repented before God and before each other. And, and God just did a restoration work. In fact, all three of those couples come to Christian life today, and they're all doing exceptionally well, by the way. All glory be to God. Okay, but, but I, I, I just kind of felt the need to bring that up again today. And, and maybe that's just me, or, or maybe some of you need to hear that. Maybe somebody, that's your one thing. I, I want to tell you this. Words, the same way anger is a seed that can grow into something very unhealthy, your words are seeds, and they always produce a harvest. They're going to produce a negative harvest or a positive harvest, depending on how you use them, but they always produce a harvest, church, and that's not the harvest you want, but you know what? You can repent of that, and you can make that right with your spouse today. Thanks for joining us today. If you have any questions or want more information, please visit ChristianLifeRantool.com.